Early on the morning of July 27, 1806, Captain Meriwether Lewis awoke to men shouting. Jumping to his feet, he spied George Drewer attempting to wrest a rifle out the hands of a Blackfeet warrior. The Fields brothers, Joseph and Reuben, were doing the same, while yet another warrior was fleeing camp with Lewis's rifle. Shucking a flintlock pistol, the captain gave chase, but ended up holding his fire as the Blackfeet in question wisely discarded the long gun and just kept on a-running. Now, the previous day, Lewis and the others, Drewer, Joseph, and Reuben, had come in contact with a small party of eight Blackfeet. Teenagers mostly, and despite some initial tension, the two parties agreed to a friendly smoke. Hell, they even decided to camp out together. Things went well that night, but near sunup, the last man on guard duty, Joseph Field, carelessly laid his rifle down within reach of one of the young warriors. As soon as he turned his back, the Blackfeet seized upon the opportunity and snatched the gun. The other warriors followed suit, and that's about the time that all hell broke loose. Now, like I mentioned a moment ago, Lewis pursued one of the warriors but was able to get his rifle back without shedding blood. The same could not be said of the Field brothers. They too caught up with one of the warriors, and during the ensuing scuffle, Reuben plunged his knife into the young Blackfeet's chest. He'd later recall that the warrior gasped but one breath before falling dead. Now, as all this was going on, the remaining Blackfeet had circled back and were making a go at the expedition's horses. Once again, Captain Lewis pursued, this time for a few hundred yards, when all of a sudden, one of the Blackfeet jumped up, aiming a musket straight at him. In turn, Lewis shouldered his own recently retrieved rifle and sent a ball smack dab into the warrior's belly. The wounded man still managed to get a shot off, though, and Lewis felt the wind as the ball grazed past his head. Luckily for Lewis and his companions, the Blackfeet were only able to make off with a few head of horses, so they did still retain enough mounts to make good their escape. Before departing, the captain placed a trade medal around the neck of the young man that Reuben had stabbed, quote, that they might be informed of who we were, end quote. And yeah, so went the very first diplomatic and cultural contact between representatives of the United States and the Great Blackfeet Confederacy. A short yet bloody encounter that would result in decades of violence. But is the story that I just recounted truly what happened? My name's Josh, and this is the Wild West Extravaganza. We'll discuss that fatal encounter with the Blackfeet more in just a bit, including what modern-day Blackfeet believe occurred. But for now, it's June of 1806, and the Lewis and Clark expedition is grinded to a dead halt. Remember, they had left Fort Clatsop back at the end of March and made their way overland to the Nez Perce. It was there where they retrieved their horses and prepared to once again cross the Bitterroot Mountains. Only problem was, the mountains in question were still covered in snow. According to the Nez Perce, it would be at least another month until they'd be able to cross over, leaving the men of the Lewis and Clark expedition no other choice but to sit around and twiddle their thumbs. Now, you'd think this would be a welcome reprieve, but the hunting remained poor and the explorers were reduced to living off of roots and the occasional plump dogs they purchased from the locals. I was actually looking through some of their journal entries during this period, and just to give you an idea of their diet, on one day in particular, Captain Lewis noted that a couple of the men returned from a hunting trip with nothing but a dead hawk and part of a salmon that they had managed to steal from a bald eagle, and they were glad to have it. Things got so bad they even took to removing the brass buttons from the remaining clothing to trade for food. Even Lewis and Clark. Understandably, morale began to plummet. Finally, on June 15th, the captains got tired of waiting, so they prematurely, and against the advice of their hosts, set off to cross the mountains all on their own. And this worked out about as well as you might imagine. Not only was there no grass for the horses, but in some areas the snow was still anywhere from 8 to 10 feet deep, and this was in mid-June. The Corps of Discovery tried to push on, but were soon forced to turn around and see if they couldn't locate some Nez Perce to help guide the way. Matter of fact, so desperate was Lewis for a native guide that he even authorized the trade of three rifles if someone was willing to help he and his men cross the mountains. Thankfully, a few teenage Nez Perce were up to the task, and six days and 156 miles later, they were once more at Traveler's Rest, the same place where they had camped back in September of the previous year. Now, that was on June 30th, and they would stay there at Traveler's Rest for three days before heading out again. It was also decided that the captains would split up the expedition into small groups and do a little extra exploring on their way back to civilization. 
Lewis would lead a party of nine men to the Great Falls of the Missouri, at which point he'd leave six of them there to prepare for a portage, while he and three others recon the Marias River. As for Captain Clark, he and his bunch, including Sacagawea and Little Pomp, would head south to Camp Fortunate, not far from where they had stayed with the Shoshone back in August 1805. Now, real quick on that, earlier in the series, I mentioned that this was near Grayling, Montana. But upon further reflection, it looks like there are two Grayling, Montanas, so I didn't want to confuse anybody. This place where the expedition camped with the Shoshone in 1805, and the same place where Clark was headed to, if you're looking for it on the map, it's where the Clark Canyon Reservoir now is, in Beaverhead County, Montana. It's from there where Sergeant Ordway and nine men would head down the Missouri River and link up with the six guys that Meriwether Lewis left at the Great Falls. Once they dug up the supplies that they had cached the previous summer, they were to head to the mouth of the Marias River and wait for Captain Lewis. Clark and the rest, totaling ten men, one woman, and a 17-month-old baby, would head overland to explore the Yellowstone, and hopefully, by early August, everybody would reunite at the confluence of the Missouri and Yellowstone Rivers. The only exceptions were Sergeant Pryor and two privates. As Clark and the others headed up the Yellowstone in canoes, they were to proceed overland with the remaining horses and head back to the Mandan. Sounds complicated. A little too complicated for my liking. But to once again quote the late great Stephen Ambrose, it was a highly ambitious plan, exceedingly complex, full of promise about what could be learned and dependent on tight timing. It certainly showed how confident the captains were about their men. For the first time, they were dividing the party to pursue different missions. They were giving large responsibilities to sergeants and privates, counting on their men to be able to handle independent operations without a hitch. It was also an exceedingly dangerous plan. The captains were taking chances that should have been avoided. In the heart of the country that the war parties of the Crow, Blackfeet, Hidatsas, and other tribes passed through regularly, the captains were dividing their platoon into five squads, so widely separated that they were not in supporting distance of one another. Lewis took the risk of dividing his command because he wanted the expedition to be as successful as possible, to bring back as much information as possible, to make every conceivable effort to broker peace among the tribes, and to begin the process of creating the American trading empire. These were important objectives, but not important enough to justify having squads as small as three men and none larger than ten roving about independently. The captains were underestimating the Indians. They had perhaps been too long with the easily dominated Clatsops and Chinooks, too long with the always friendly Nez Perce. End of quote. So yeah, it goes without saying that this was quite the bold plan indeed. Now, Lewis and his party followed the Bitterroot north before taking off east along Clark Fork River and then the Blackfoot River, passing through where present-day Missoula, Montana, now stands. And by July 7th, they crossed the Continental Divide at what's now known as the Lewis and Clark Pass. They'd eventually strike the Sun River and begin following it down to the Great Falls of the Missouri, where, as fate would have it, they were welcomed by having seven of their 17 horses stolen. Believe it or not, Lewis would then dispatch George Drewer alone to track down the thieves. He was gone for something like four days and, upon returning, stated that he had shadowed the war party quite a distance but gave up on account of them having too much of a head start. Now what Drewer would have done had he caught up with the horse thieves, who knows? After all, he was just one man. But then again, by all accounts, George Drewer was one hell of a man. All total, Lewis would stay there at the Great Falls for around five days, and then on July 16th, he headed out to explore the Marias. Just him, the ever-impressive Drewer, and the Field Brothers, Reuben and Joseph, along with six horses. Now about the Marias River, Captain Lewis originally named it after his young cousin, Maria Wood. In a totally not creepy sign of affection, Lewis wrote the following, quote, it is true that the hue of the waters of this turbulent and troubled stream but illy comport with the pure celestial virtues and amiable qualifications of that lovely fair one, Maria. But on the other hand, it is a noble river. End quote. So in all actuality, if you want to be correct, it's Maria's river, not the Marias River. However, it does appear the Montana locals do call it the Marias, so I also chose to go with that pronunciation. And shout out to the nice lady over there at Missouri River Outfitters who helped me with that one. This is not a paid advertisement, but she was cool, so I figured I'd give them a plug. 
If you're interested, they do offer guided trips on both the Missouri and the Marias rivers. Link down below. Now, if you'll recall, as the expedition was headed west on the Missouri the previous year, before they had ever reached the Great Falls, they ran into a big fork in the river. They ended up taking the South Fork, which proved to be the Missouri, but it's that North Fork, or river, that Lewis named after his cousin Maria, who he totally did not have a crush on, okay? Now, as to the importance of the Marias River, the newly purchased territory of Louisiana only went as far north as the tributaries of the Missouri. The hope was that at least one of these tributaries would extend to the 50th parallel and thus grant even more land to the still-growing United States of America. Sadly, for the Americans, that would not work out. Captain Lewis and the others tracked the Marias all the way to where it forked into two branches, Cut Bank Creek and Two Medicine River. Seeing as how the Cut Bank was coming from the north, that's the one they followed. Within about a day, however, and about 170 miles south of his intended target, the 50th parallel, Lewis realized that Cut Bank Creek was beginning to turn southwest. Quote, I now have lost all hope of the waters of this river ever extending to north latitude 50 degrees. End quote. They were still pretty far north, though, not far from Browning, Montana, on what's now the Blackfeet Reservation, in spitting distance of Glacier National Park, and within smelling distance of Canada. And as it turns out, they were not alone. As the explorers turned south on July 22nd, they spotted a large herd of horses, around 30 head, accompanied by eight Blackfeet warriors. And what's more, the warriors spotted them. Worth pointing out that Lewis had, initially, months prior, hoped to make contact with the Blackfeet. In a perfect world, he would have liked to have ridden north with delegates from both the Shoshone and Nez Perce and work out a great truce between them all just in an attempt, of course, to bring him under the control of the great American trading empire. That said, much like his hopes for the Marias River, and much like Jefferson's dream of an all-water route to the Pacific, such diplomatic endeavors were proven to be mere fantasies. And now, in the summer of 1806, far from the aid of Captain Clark and the others, the Blackfeet were about the last damn thing that Lewis wanted to see, especially after hearing all the warnings from the other tribes. Nonetheless, Captain Meriwether Lewis met the threat head on. As soon as one of the warriors began charging his way, Lewis ordered the American flag unfurled. He then nudged his own horse forward and told the men that if attacked, he planned on fighting to the death rather than to give up his gun or valuable papers. As the lone warrior charged closer, Lewis dismounted and held out his hand. One last attempt at diplomacy, and as crazy as it sounds, it worked. Minutes later, the American explorers were shaking hands with the Blackfeet. And as I alluded to earlier, the Blackfeet, most of them teenagers, would end up camping with Lewis and the others overnight. The explorers supplied them with tobacco, and the Blackfeet, in turn, shared that they were part of a large village no further than a day's ride to the west, and that there was another large band of Blackfeet not far to the south. Also, according to them, they had a white man living among them, a Canadian trader. Before turning in for the night, Lewis gave his usual speech and told the Blackfeet how much of a better deal they'd get with the Americans and how he wished to broker a peace between them and the Shoshone and Nez Perce. So all in all, not a bad meeting, but probably not the best idea to bring up the Blackfeet's ancestral enemies. Then, of course, just a few hours later, Lewis would awake to a scene of utter chaos. This was that skirmish I talked about earlier, where Reuben Field stabbed one of the warriors and Lewis ended up shooting another. Worth noting that the Blackfeet tell a different story. According to them, it was not a party of eight warriors, but instead just two youngsters, aged 12 and 13. Captain Lewis kept on insisting that they camp with he and his men overnight, saying that they had presents, so the young men acquiesced. Later that night, however, I guess the boys got cold feet and decided to sneak out of camp, but that's when Reuben Field woke up and stabbed one of them, followed by Captain Lewis shooting the other. As far as who's telling the truth... I've got no idea. I'll leave that up for you to decide. Either way, Lewis and his men weren't going to stick around and wait on reinforcements. Once they placed that medal around the neck of the dead warrior, they saddled up and pushed south as quickly as they could. Matter of fact, so nervous were they about Blackfeet retribution that they ended up riding all day and not stopping until about 2 o'clock that next morning, putting over an estimated 100 miles between them and the scene of the encounter. Even then, despite their exhaustion, they wouldn't tarry for long. After just a couple hours of sleep, Lewis woke the men up and they resumed their journey, 
soon reaching the Missouri River where Sergeant Ordway and the others were awaiting. Remember, Lewis had left six men behind there at the Great Falls, and they were soon joined by Ordway and nine others. This bunch was tasked with digging up those supplies that they had buried the previous summer and then portaging them over the falls, which they did, meeting Lewis several miles downriver at what they called the Lower Portage Camp. If I'm not mistaken, this is about a mile below where the Belt Creek meets the Missouri. Now, I'm a little hazy on this part, but it was either there at the Lower Portage or back at what they called the Higher Portage on the other side of the falls, where the previous year they had cached one of the P-Rows and a few canoes. Still concerned about the Blackfeet, Lewis had the men load all the supplies up in said vessels and they launched into the river, heading downstream about 15 miles before finally making their evening camp on the south bank. Hell of a couple of last days, but they came through unscathed. And for the next week or so, they made good time traveling downriver with the current. At least they did before Captain Merriweather Lewis got shot in the ass. Yeah, he got shot in the ass. Or to any of you Mormons who may be listening... The buttocks. And if you'd like to hear how that turned out, I do hope you'll join me here next week for the sixth and final installment in the series on Lewis and Clark. We'll examine the aforementioned ass shooting along with the Corps of Discovery's return to civilization. If you've still got a hankering for some more true tales from the wild and woolly west, please head on over to wildwestextra.com. While you're there, hit that contact button. Let me know what's on your mind. And before we go, if you're looking for an ad-free Wild West extravaganza experience, I do know that commercials can get annoying. You do have a couple of different options. First, there's Into History. Just head on over to intohistory.com forward slash Wild West Extra and sign up for a membership. You'll not only get the Wild West extravaganza completely ad-free, but a number of other great history podcasts ad-free as well. Depending on your membership level, you'll also gain access to Into History exclusive content, as well as the Discord server. Just a way to chat with fellow history lovers like myself. That's IntoHistory.com forward slash Wild West Extra. And I know I haven't mentioned this in quite a while, but there's also the Wild West Extravaganza Patreon. Yes, it does still exist, and my patrons are still awesome. There's only one membership tier, $5 a month, but for that $5, you gain access to the entire back catalog of the Wild West Extravaganza, 100% ad-free. And that back catalog does include the very early and highly embarrassing stuff that I recorded when I was just figuring out how to podcast. That's at patreon.com forward slash Wild West Extra. All right, till next week, adios.